thing that starts streaming. There we go. And you're checking, right? <laughs> All right, thank you. Because otherwise I would have forgotten. All right, so we're gonna go with this test and use it as a practice test. There's no guarantee of whether I will ask questions in the same way or, you know, um, but this is at least, it will give you some idea of you know, what kind of question I have asked in the past. Is that okay? Yeah. So with me, you know, what is, what is in the past usually may not be a good indication of what is in the future. So take it with a grain of salt. <laughs> <clears throat> How many of you have taken the personality test? Some of you. Did you guys look into the, what the uh, letter means you know, with each position? The last one is a P or J, right? J for judging and P for perceiving. So did you guys read up on uh, what each trait means? What P you know, represents or what J represents? Okay, so to summarize you know, quickly, J means you know uh, those people have a strong sense of how things ought to be, and then a P means the opposite: people who you know usually do not have a strong sense of how things ought to be. And I think I'm like about ninety percent leaning to the P side. <laughs> so except for certain things, okay, you know very few things, you know I don't have a strong sense of how things ought to be which includes you know, what kind of questions, styles of questions, you know, that sort of thing. <clears throat> All right, so let me start from the beginning. Um, okay, so the first thing is you want to make sure that you write down your name first, okay, because I don't want to get an exam with no name, no student ID, nothing whatsoever. If it's only one, usually it's not a big problem because I can usually figure out, okay, there's one, only one person who <clears throat> did not have a you know, named uh, exam. If two people do this, then we have a problem, don't we? Yep. Okay, so write down your name first. It doesn't take much time. Um, second thing is it is open book and open notes. Um, when I say note electronics, it is with the exclusion of a scientific calculator. So you are allowed to bring a scientific calculator. Even a graphing one is fine. Okay? I don't think you will need a graphing calculator because it's not calculus, so you know, the graphing part is not going to be very beneficial. Um, I personally would bring a typical basic you know, scientific calculator. Um, even log and you know, those sub functions may not be useful in the exam. Okay? You can bring one that has binary and hexadecimal capabilities. You know, that might help a little bit, but not really that significantly. The assessment is individual, which means you know when the exam has started, you guys can only work on your own exam. Okay, if you need to borrow something from another student, you know I think pencils, writing instruments, you know that sort of thing is okay, um, but definitely not like oh you know I forgot to print you know this note, you know can I borrow it from you? Not during the exam. Okay. Um, the other thing is anything that is in my notes, anything that is presented either in the lab or in the lecture, um, I cannot explain those things again during the exam. So, you know, I cannot answer questions like, oh, you know, uh, what is this gate representing in a, in a schematic? Because those things were introduced in Logisim and in one of the labs. Um, right here. Um, most people do not need additional sheets of paper, but if you think that you might, bring your own. Okay, I might remember to bring some extra sheets of paper, but you know, but then again, I may not. So it's better that you bring you know extra you know pieces of paper. Make sure that you write legibly because otherwise, I cannot give points to things that I do not that I cannot read, not that I cannot understand, but I don't I cannot even see the words. Um, in this particular exam, questions have equal weight. I am inclining to keep this standard. Um, because it makes it easier for you guys to evaluate and say, okay, uh, which question should I answer first? If the questions have different weights, then you kind of have to look into, okay, this question is worth more points, but it's also more difficult. That other question is easy, but it's not worth too many points. Which one should I start first? That makes it, the decision-making process more difficult. 
But if they all have equal weight, then you just look at each question and go like, oh, this one is absolutely easiest. Start with that one. Um, I will give you a summary of how many questions there are in the exam. Uh, there was one year that I was double print that, that I was printing on double sides of, of a piece of paper, and somebody just forgot that there are questions on the other side. And then the, the, the really bad part was that person left early, thinking, oh yeah, I got everything. <laughs> so that was really bad. If, if that person ran out of time, you know, and not realize there are questions on the other side of the paper, it's like, eh, that's kind of bad too, but not too bad, right? So yeah, but that person just left early because you know, he, he or she thought that um, you know, all the questions were answered. Uh, the exam accounts for 20% of your final grade, just like the second exam, the final exam is going to be 40%. All right, so question number one. So question number one is asking the question of how can I unify a, an adder and a subtraction? Okay. In other words, the question is, okay, I know most of you have done the uh, carry look ahead adder as a part of the lab activities. I think there were two lab activities you know, leading to the design of the look ahead adder, the carry look ahead adder. But we also talked about in class you know, how the subtractor is not really that much different compared to an adder. Okay, so in fact, I tell you exactly right here. Okay, so you don't even have to bring up your notes. You know, at this point, I explained that for an adder, the G term is the conjunction of x y, the P term is the dis disjunction or the uh, uh, or of the x y. Okay, that's from the notes as well. Um, for the subtractor, it is uh, the negation of x and y. It is the negation of x or y. That's the only difference. If you look at the circuitry of a carry look ahead adder and a follow look ahead subtractor, the only difference is how the G and the P terms are defined. Which means the complicated part, which is the carry bits, they are the same. K3 and, and uh, T3 are structurally exactly the same. You have the same AND gates, the same splitters, the same OR gate at the end, they're identical. So the question is asking, um, I want to design a gate circuit, okay? So the gate circuit is known as S, you know, as a function, and it has two parameters. A is one parameter, A, X is the other parameter. Parameter A is basically saying, are we adding or are we subtracting? If we are adding, A is a one. If we are subtracting, A is a zero, okay? So parameter A is just a specifier of Okay, are we adding or are we subtracting? X is basically the same thing as the X over here. So it is serving as an input in this case because I want to combine these two bits, okay? I want to combine the bit A, which specifies whether we are adding or subtracting, and bit X, which specifies the bit that is actually coming in from the input pin X. And so that the output is either the negative version of X or the non-negative version of X. So that that way, whatever the output of this you know, S circuit is, I can use it um, to feed into the AND gate for the G term, or feed it into the disjunction or the OR gate for the P terms. Okay, are we still doing okay so far with this? So I enumerated basically all of the possible cases. Um, if, um, the first parameter A is a one, and S one X is just X non-negated. Uh, if the first parameter A is a zero, then S is zero X is the negation of X. So the first thing you need to do is to find a truth table so that you can figure out what kind of um, logic gate can compute this S function. So are we, are we still doing okay so far with this discussion? What the question is presenting, um, not so much what it's asking because the next part you'll ask what it is um, asking for. Okay, so if you don't have any questions at this point, I'm gonna bring up the tablet. Yep, go ahead. Resistor.
So I would need an extra pin to the overall adder or subtractor circuit, yes. Yeah. Resistor gate. What is a resistor gate? Well, not a resistor gate. Uh, I don't know for sure what you're referring to, but let me let me just go ahead and present the solution first, and then you can comment on that when you get to that point. Sure. Okay. So we now have your a and, and x as independent variables. Each one is a bit. It can be a zero or a one. So we say, what if a is zero, which specifies we are dealing with a subtraction? What if a is specifying a one, which means we are dealing with an addition? So while a is 0, x can be 0 or 1. While, x, while a is 1, x can be 0 or 1. So now, on the last column, that's a x, we just need to know, you know, are we negating x or not? When we are subtracting, we need to negate x, which basically means if x is 0, then the output of this circuit should be a 1, and the other one would be a 0. When a is a 1, it means we are adding. When we are adding, we are feeding x un uh, not negated to g and p, the, the gates for, for computing p's and g's. So this one is non-negated. x is 0 by itself because it was 0 to begin with. And this is also non-negated, which means it's a 1. OK, so when you look at this, um, you know, the, the function asks, what kind of gates almost can get this done? What does it look like? <coughs> kind of look like the, the kind of look like the, the flip side of the exclusive or, right? Because with an exclusive or, you get a one whenever uh, the two inputs are different. This one is exactly the opposite. So as it turns out, there is a gate in Logisim called a XNOR or NOR N X O R. I think. Let, let me double check because I was just playing with that a little bit earlier. Okay, look at, let's look at the gates. So it's called an XNOR, or a uh, exclusive negated OR gate. But I think that's the wrong term. It should be called a negated XOR gate. But I guess you know, either way it's not pronounceable. <laughs> NXOR, you know, how would you uh, pronounce that? Enzor? Enzor. Okay, it's two syllables. Can you shorten it to one single syllable? <laughs> okay, so that means we can do something like this. Okay, A and X, this is a regular exclusive OR gate, and then we negate the output. This will get us the trick. Whatever the output is, this output here can go to one of the pins of the AND gate to compute the P term, and excuse me, the OR gate to compute the P term, and the AND gate to compute the G term. Yep? Is that the input in the X value? Yep. Exactly. It flips the X value whenever A is a zero, then A is a one, then it is just passing through X over to the other side. Yep. So that's the solution in terms of gates, but if we wanted to just write it out as like a you can do that too. So if you, yeah, if you want to write it as an expression only using and or and uh, not gates, um, then you look at the rows where the result is a one. So for the first row, the result is a one, but that's when a and x are both zeros. So we need a conjunction to make use of a and x such that the uh, conjunction is a one when a is a zero and x is zero. So that conjunction is going to be not a, not n, not x. That's not what I'm asking. What I'm asking is, I thought on the question it said you could use xor as well, so it could have been used to be not a, xor, x, but the a, xor, x in parentheses. <coughs> Say that one more time. Yeah. So you do a, xor, x, wrap mm -hmm. that whole thing in parentheses and negate it. Yep. Just do that. 
Yep, you can do that. So basically you're saying S A X is the negation of A exclusive or X. Yep. No, no, I am not going to be picky about the notation as long as I understand it and there's no chance that I can misunderstand it for something else, okay, then it's okay. In other words, if you want to spell exclusive or here, it's fine. If you want to spell out exclusive or, or if you want to abbreviate as EOR, that's fine. If you want to abbreviate to XOR, that's fine too because those are the two standard ways to spell out exclusive or. Uh, if you don't like this negation and you want to use the mathematical notation, that's fine. If you want to spell out NOT, that's fine. But if you use a tilde here, it's not fine. Because those two things are different. A tilde is a bitwise knot. Um, go ahead. Why do I care? Because this is all based on the observation. Um, it's all based on the observation that when you're dealing with subtraction, G, the G term is uh, the conjunction of the negation of X and Y. Okay, so the negation is just you know, because of the, the fact that we're dealing with a subtractor. Correct. So it would be not A and not X or A X. Is that what you spelled out? Uh, no, I did not and then in parentheses not A and X or not X and A. That would not be the same as this. The reason why we, we have negation of A and negation of X is because on the first row A is a zero, X is also a zero but we want the conjunction to become a one. So the only way to make that conjunction a one is to negate A and then negate X and then do a conjunction of those two. This works for all four terms as well. Huh? I think this works for all four terms as well. I guess I just talked to you about that. Okay, because I cannot visualize the... It, I can say it if that's okay. Okay, go ahead. So it's not, and then in parentheses, uh -huh. uh, not A, X, or... Oh, okay, I see. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, that will work. That will work because this itself is just exclusive or, so you're negating the exclusive or. Okay. Yeah, so that works too. And I apologize for not uh, interpreting the. Yeah, that's a problem, kind of unique to uh, infix notation because of the use of parentheses and stuff like that. Yep. Is this the only answer you would have accepted, or could you have used the Oh, any one of these would be acceptable. Yeah, you could have you used can give me this, you can give me this, you can give me this, you can give me this. You can so give if we use like three bits, for example, like an and, and an and, and they both fit into an ex, um, exclusive or. That would work too. That would, yep. Okay. Yep. They're so all, as long as it works, it As long works. as it works, it's fine. Yep. The only uh, answer that I would definitely not accept is something that looks like this. <laughs> <laughs> that I will not take as, a, as an answer. That would get a zero. Just because Canvas doesn't let me specify negative scores. <laughs> <laughs> so is that, is that okay? So I'm pretty flexible in terms of you know, what notation. As long as I understand it, it's okay. All right. So getting back to the question itself, so that basically addresses your know, part A. And part B, I think I made a mistake somewhere um, because I said you know, uh, a dedicated three-bit adder needs five levels of gate propagation to finish computation. Okay, so here's the thing about, okay, so how do we know how many gate propagations do we need to finish computation? Okay, so to answer that question, uh, this is from the earlier lab, yep? I have a question about so do we have to know what the shapes of the bits 
You can draw a box and then spell out what the gate is. Oh yeah, just like a door gate. You press door and the gate. You don't know you don't know which like what the shape looks like. If it is clear, just if you spell it out clearly, okay. yeah. Okay. So to answer that question, to answer the question of the gate, how many levels of propagation? Um, I did this earlier, you know, in the early lab. Okay. Um, and this is also, you know, the uh, the three bit outer, except I didn't get the whole thing done, not yet. Um, so I got a part of it done. Maybe um, okay. I think it's better off to use um, this notation here. Okay. So let me let me do with this part here. Okay. So we got x, y, and then k zero as the input pins. Okay. The x and the y's need to be combined to become the three terms that we know of. So this is just for um, a regular adder, okay? So for a regular adder, you have to get X and Y into an AND gate, a multi-bit AND gate, and whatever comes out here is known to us as the G terms, okay? Um, and then you can use an OR gate here. Whatever comes out of this is our uh, P term. So once again, X goes here, Y goes here, and then the last one, you know, this is from one of your homework assignments or lab activities. This is Q. It is basically coming from the exclusive OR between X and Y. So are we doing okay so far with this? Okay, so after this, we have to uh, deal with the more difficult part of a carry load to head adder, which is how do we compute the individual carry bits. Okay, so we'll go ahead and look up, because I want this one to be accurate. So we're going to look it up and find out what K3 or how K3 is defined. So this K3 is actually correct, okay? So we have um, G and P and K0 coming in as input pins. Um, the G terms are all split up into three parts. The P term is split up into three parts as well. So I'm not going to replicate exactly how the thing is wired up. I'll just kind of you know, state the fact that it has three end gates here and then one OR gate over here. Okay, so we'll go ahead and draw that picture. So we have um, three AND gates and then one OR gate as the final output. Um, one of these only has two inputs, one of these has three inputs, and then the other one, the last one, has four inputs. Now the number of inputs is relevant later on in a separate question, but for now they're not that relevant, okay? So we know the G's and the P's will go into these gates somehow after some splitters, okay? And then K0 also goes into one of these pins, okay? I cannot remember exactly which one, which is not important in this discussion. What comes out here is one of the K's. This is K3. Is that okay? What are we really trying to get to in an atom? Is it just the overall curve <coughs> bit, or are there other bits that we're interested in? The S, -term, S -term. The sum, right? The S terms, the actual sums. So how do we get to those? So now we have to take the K terms, okay? So there's, there's another OR gate here for K2, and then K1, and then K0, which is just an input pin. So those would have to be combined with the Q terms, right? So we have another exclusive OR here, where the output is the S term, the inputs would be the, the, uh, the K terms, and the partial sum, which is the Q term. Is, is it okay so far? So this is without the unification of a adder and a subtractor into the same circuit. This is just a regular carry look ahead adder. So the question is how many uh, gates do we have to get through to get to the sum, to get to the final answer? That's the question. So, so you have to look at the longest path because there, there are very short paths. Like K0 um, goes straight into one of the inputs of the sum. So that's, that hardly has any propagation, right? Because it only has one single gate of propagation. So you have to look at the longest path. The longest path would be the X and the Y signals going through an AND gate or OR gate to compute the G and the P terms. 
g of the p terms would be split, but the split term has no propagational delay. So they split and then they get fed into these conjunction gates. The output of the conjunction, conjunction gates goes into the OR gate. The output of the OR gate, this one does not go into the exclusive OR gate for a three-bit adder, but the definitions for K2 and K1, they do, okay? So your halves becomes one, two, three, four. So the question is actually incorrect because the question states that there are five gates of propagation. There are actually only four gates of propagation for a regular adder or subtractor. Yep? You said we were counting the number of labels to get to the sum bits. Yep. Why do we count K3? K3 does not go to the sum. K3, you know, for a three bit adder, K3 it has its own upper pin as carry out. Oh, well, the but K2 does. So K2 and K1, they're also results of OR gates. And the OR gates are also fed by AND gates. And you also have P and G terms and K0 feeding into those AND gates. So as far as K propagation is concerned, K2, even though it's simpler, it still has the same level of gates. Oh, so it goes from the ANDs to the OR to the K. Correct. Yep. Could you specify the OR gates again? Huh? The OR um, propagation gates? Could you? Okay, so the first level of gates are the ones that compute the G and the P terms. The second level of gates will be the AND gates inside each K1, K2, and K3 circuit. The third level would be the OR gate of each one of the K1, K2, and K3 circuit. And then the last one is going to be the exclusive OR that will take K0, K1, K2 on one side, and then all Q terms from the other side to give you the actual sum. That is the longest path for the entire atom. And as a result, you have one, two, three, and four levels of gates. Yep. So like with any sort of question about gate propagation, only have to be the longest path? Yes. I think I might understand why um, in the question I said you know, there may be five levels. Because if you do not use an exclusive OR here, then it becomes you know, one extra level because you're using two AND gates and the feed into one single OR gate. So four or five levels. But the question is not even asking that. So if you go back to the question, the question of part B, part B of Q1 is asking, after unifying an adder and a subtractor using this approach, how many levels of gates propagation do we need for a three-bit adder or subtractor? So what you need to know is how are we going to change this design if we are to use the S circuit to make a single circuitry that can do add and subtract at the same time? Yeah, we're just adding one more level. So when we add that one single level, it's going to be added here. This is our S circuitry, and this is also going to be where the add circuitry is going to be inserted. So now you have five levels because you have one, two, three, four, and then five levels. Oh, just do four gates. Hmm? So just do four gates. It's just before the G and just before the P. But you can also just do it once and then feed the result to both of those. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Uh, for the for the wouldn't it just be on the P strictly because oh, I'm sorry on the G because P already. Nope. Nope. Because it has to be negated. It has to be negated to both. <laughs> yeah, but for P and the oh, I see. So to. So to change the circuitry to, to reflect that, let me let me erase some of the connections here. Okay, so okay. So the change is right here. I can just add a mm, well we know what that kind of gate is, right? It is a negated NOR gate. Okay. I was thinking of both. We're looking at only the adder right now. Oops. Uh, yeah. Right, if you're just looking at the adder, it's different. This is A. I was looking at the subtractor too. Yeah, so but this unifies an adder and a subtractor. It is the same circuit. 
If you specify this A as a one, the whole circuit becomes an adder. If you specify a zero for this A, it becomes a subtractor. Um, but if we were looking at three base subtraction, that already has five levels, right? Yeah. So no, a subtractor only has four levels. Even though it's not X, it would that have another level? Um, okay, that's a good point. The, the not is usually negated at the input of a gate here, so it doesn't count as a gate by itself. So are we okay so far with this? So in other words, to be very safe, you can say if the unification adds one additional levels of one additional level of gate propagation to the entire thing. Yep. Is this the smallest you can get, or is this like a is this like the smallest subtract adder you can get, or is it like a total algorithm where it's like getting these down to Um I think this is the smallest you can get. Okay. Yep. Yep. Um, that for that discussion, you have to go back to the module, the two modules, one that talks about binary addition, the other one that talks about binary ad the subtraction. That explains why there's the negation in front of the X. In front of the X is your question about is your question about why there's a negation here for subtraction? Okay. All right. So, any additional questions about part A or part B of question number one? Just by explaining when the how much is the length of the one by right? Like for explaining the answer, do you want us to actually write bar graphs so you can like fully explain it? Or just no, just you, know, you just have to say that you know this the unification part, which is the the circuitry to implement the S function is going to be between the input pin X and the input of the G and also the P gate. So that lengthens the longest path by one more gate. That would be a su sufficient explanation. Yep. So would you be able to see that just from like looking at? Yes. So if you if you display it pictorially, yes, that would that would also you do the trick. No, no, I mean like, for just rather than having to like go through that whole big thing with the gates, like could you just be like, oh, well, when I define S of a a x, that's mm -hmm. adding one extra gate to the whole formula. Um, no, because you have to you have to basically let me know that that is on the critical path. It's on the longest path already, okay. because anything that you do with Q, you can introduce additional stages after you compute Q, and that won't change anything for a long time because Q is computed but is not utilized until the very end. So you have to kind of emphasize that you know, this S gate here, or the uh, negated exclusive OR gate, is along the, sh the longest path already. It is feeding into what we already know as the longest path. Okay. And that's why it lengthens the, the propagation by one. So like if it, like the counter example of that would be something where you like add a gate but it's not on the longest path. That is correct, yep. Oops, go ahead. Things that can be done in parallel is on the same level. So let me go back to here. So according to this picture, as soon as your input pins x, y, and k zero are stabilized, which means you know, the signals are correct, the levels are correct, we immediately start to compute. Now let's not take uh, the unification into consideration. Okay, so so pretend that this is not here. Okay, so that means we can compute g, p, and q all at the same time because these circuitries are in power, they're not in series. Is that okay? So that's why the P, G, and Q terms, they're all at the same level of propagation or delay. It's, it's the first level. The second level would be the AND gates involved in the K1, K2, and K3 sub-circuit. Um, is that okay? 
But this state is not ready to do any computation. Even though one side of this is coming from Q, which is now ready, but the K terms are not computed yet. So whatever is coming out of this exclusive OR gate is not the correct answer. There's something coming out of it, but it's not the right answer. So the third level would be the OR gates of each K, of the K1, K2, and K3 subcircuits. Because these cannot be stable until the AND gates are done with their results. So after the OR gate, the K2 and the K1, they feed into this exclusive OR gate. So this exclusive OR gate is the fourth level. So that's how you know, I compute you know, the number of propagational levels. So basically things th that can be done at the same time is one level. Is that okay? Yep. I have a question about that. So like, when you talk about like levels, you're referring specifically to the longest path, right? So like each level on the longest path, right? Mm. You can also think of it as the delay, you know, like unit time from the time when x, y, and k zero have the correct input how much time does it take for the output of one gate to have the correct output? That's basically what it's asking for. Okay. Any other questions? No questions about this one? Okay, let's move on. Next one, Q2. I think you guys will like Q, question number two. Um, okay, so let me, let me erase this stuff here because you know, I, I did it yesterday for, hmm? Okay. Okay. So, this is the question. <laughs> so the question is, you know, I give you a subtraction of four bits, and you have to fill in the blanks, basically. But you have to use the long format of subtracting, so no you know, shorthanding you know, the whole thing. Which also means, you know, even if you have a calculator that can do binary subtraction, it's not going to be helping you much. In fact, when I graded <coughs> this particular question, I ignore the last row altogether. In other words, I only give weight to the intermediate rows as well as the flags later on. Because any calculator that can do binary subtraction or binary representation can quickly give you the answer right away. So that's worth zero points to me. Okay, so let's work on this one. One minus one zero. is a zero. Zero minus a zero is a zero. And because neither subtraction gives me a borrow of one, the overall borrow from the next digit is a zero. Zero minus one is a one, and that immediately gives me a borrow of one to the, from the next uh, column. One minus zero is a one. One minus zero is a one. One minus one is a zero. Neither gives me any borrow of one, so that's why we have a borrow of zero from the next column. Zero minus one is a one, that gives me an overall borrow, and then one minus zero is just one. So that's how we you know, fill in all the zeros and ones, but that's not the end of the question. You know, I got all of these answers here as well. Let's erase those also. Okay, all right. Some of you probably have already remembered what you saw earlier. <laughs> okay, so the overall borrow is easy, right? Because once you have done all these calculations, whatever this particular bit is, is the overall borrow. So that is a one in this case. The sign is also easy because the sign always refers to the sign of the result of the calculation, which also is known as the most significant bit of the result. So the most significant bit of the result is this bit here, and that turns out to be a one as well. Overflow is not as easy, because it is not a particular bit of this entire thing, so you have to do some calculations. So the overflow for subtraction is defined to be um, the negation of this, and the non-negative version of this, and the non-negative version of this, or the negative, a non-negative version of this, and the negative version of this, and the negative version of this. 
So you apply that equation or that expression, and the answer is going to be a one. Now, there are multiple ways to come to the conclusion that it's overflow, okay? That's just one, okay? First one is, I think, the simplest way, which is very mechanical. You look at the expression that defines the overflow, you plug in the values, and then you come up with the answer. Second way. Second way is to look at the, um, whether the sign makes sense or not, okay? This is a non-negative number. This is a negative number. So if you subtract a negative quantity from a positive or non-negative non quantity, what type of sign are you expecting as the result of the subtraction? It should be non-negative. Ah, but it's negative. So the sign doesn't make sense. It has to be lying. So that's why you have an overflow. There's one more way. So the one more way, the other one more way is to look at the actual value represented by the big hashes. 0, 1, 0, 1 is 5. 1, 0, 1, 1 is negative 5. Okay? So you are subtracting negative 5 from 5, which is which is 10, right? <laughs> it's 10. Okay. So you look at the number wheel and you ask, um, is 10 representable as a signed value when you're only given four bits? And it's not. The most negative value that you can represent using only four bits is negative eight. The most positive value is seven. 10 is greater than seven, and therefore it is not represented at all. That is why you have an overflow. Your, the value of the subtraction is exceeding what you can actually represent. Is that okay? So any one of those three methods should give you a consistent same answer. So whichever one you want to choose depends on you know which what method is better for you. Yep. Did you say the maximum representation was seven or eight? Is that the way seven. 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 Because the negative eight, eight on the other side, but seven on the positive side. Can you say the overflag one Huh? Can you say the overflag one was one time? It was not M. Right. Or M not S not D. Correct. Okay. Yep. yep. All right. So up, what about the L flag? How do we define the L flag, which means less than in the uh, interpretation of signed values? It's the exclusive or of the sign and the overflow. You guys remember that one? From your expression, it's not... Did I talk about the overflow flag is basically saying the sign flag is lying? Yeah, yes. yeah. There you go. Wait, those are lying. L is for lying? The overflow flag is saying whether the sign flag is lying or not. If the overflow flag is a 1, it means the sign flag is lying. If the overflow flag is a 0, it means the sign flag is not lying. How is that going to help us with the L flag? How can we tell whether the minimum end is less than the subtract end? Wait, are you saying that like L is S XOR L? Yeah. Okay. It is in the notes too, is in that module, the module that talks about comparison. So it's not S uh, L or L not S? You can look at it that way too, yep. So the, S, the L flag in this case is a zero because the old flag says the sign flag is lying. So if the sign flag says you know, the middle end is less than the uh, subtract hand, but then you know, the old flag says no, 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 the sign flag is lying, that means the, sub the middle end is not less than the subtract hand. And as a result, the L flag, L stands for less, is a zero. Are we still doing okay with this? Okay. Moving on to the next question, number three. Okay, assuming the use of two input exclusive OR and an OR gates with optionally negated inputs where the latencies are four, two, and three nanoseconds respectively, what is the total latency to compute K3 in an optimal three-bit carry look-ahead adder? Not unified, okay? So we are not talking about the unified version of the adder and subtractor into one single circuit. 
has over uh, that has an overall carry bit. Show your reasoning and computation step by step. If you show me the picture, you know that really helps a lot. Okay, so for this one, we can go back and look at Logisim, and particularly we look at this circuitry here. Okay, there's there are a few circuitries we have to look at, but this one is the most important one. Okay, but you might say, but we have propagational delay because of these gates too. Okay, this gate has a propagational delay. Um, and then this gate also has a propagational delay. Well, <coughs> they do, but there's nothing too tricky about these two. So I'm just going to leave them alone and not talk about them. What makes this particular gate different or special? And what makes this one special? And what makes this one special? According to the restrictions of the question. Okay, so let's read the question again. The question says that we can only have two input gates. So the key is two input. So when you look at the circuitry that we had earlier, this one is a three input uh, gate, this is a four input gate. So we cannot have those. So now the question is, if I cannot have a three input AND gate, how are we going to do this? Exactly. So what we need to do in this case, so let me let me see if I can show it um, by doing it, right? So we have this, that, and then we just wire things up. And these three become the input, and then this becomes the overall output. So when you look at this particular sub-circuit here, do you think it's going to do the same thing as a regular three input AND gate? Yes. Okay. Sorry. But it, but but it has extra latency, right? It has extra <coughs> latency because the second gate cannot give you the correct result unless the first gate is already done. So your latency is now doubled for this guy. What about this one? Well, that one is not much more complicated than this. So when you look at the four input AND gate, it just looks a little bit uglier, not by much. Because what you do is you get rid of this wire, and then we duplicate this part, and then whatever is the output of this gets into here. So, but in terms of propagational delay, it is the same thing as the three input one, because the first, the first two gates can occur at the same time. They can compute at the same time. And they come up with the answers at the same time, so that means the overall propagational delay or the latency is still the same thing, which is two times the latency of a regular AND gate. Yep? Uh, OR gates are just the same thing, right? Yep, OR gate is the same thing. So this OR gate over here, this OR gate here, would look exactly like this, except you change all the AND gates to OR gates. But that also means that the propagational <coughs> latency of this OR gate, of the single four input OR gate, is going to be twice of the propagational delay of the two input OR gates. Is that okay? So now we look at the overall picture, which we have in, oh, on the uh, tablet right here. Okay, so on the tablet, we just have to label the numbers now, okay? So let's go back to the question because I cannot remember which one is four, which one is two, and which one is three. So four applies to the exclusive OR. Okay, so the exclusive OR, this one is a four, and this one is a four as well, because both of those are two input exclusive OR gates. Okay, now you have to remember there are two attributes that may sound confusing. You have the number of inputs, and then you have the bit width. The bit width applies to how wide is the wire coming into each input of the gate. So the number of input is not the same as the width of the wire going into the gate. All right, second thing is, um, the two nanosecond applies to AND gates. Okay, so we'll label the AND gates. We have a two here, 
this one is two times two, so it's a four. And I think those are the AND gates, all the AND gates that we have. And then we have the OR gates. The OR gates have three nanoseconds of delay. So this one is three nanoseconds. This one is three plus three, which is six. So now we have all the um, gates labeled. And you have to look at the longest path. So once again, the key is to look at the, the longest path because you know, we are not done until the longest path is done. This four here doesn't really bother us much because the result of this is not utilized until the very last four. The last four is important, but this, the first four is not. The first exclusive war gate is not important. Between the two and the three, which are used to compute the G terms and the P terms, the three is the important one. Because both the G terms and the P terms, the G terms and the P terms are fed into the second uh, level of AND gates. So you have to look at the slower one, which are the ones coming from here. So I'm, not, I'm just going to label the three to mean that this is in the, the longer path. Okay. <coughs> so out of these three AND gates, which can compute at the same time, yep? Wait, really fast. Uh, those two, three, and four nanoseconds, you just defined it that way? Yes, in the question. So you just said that? Yeah. Okay. Just, I just pulled the number out of thin air. Making sure that it wasn't based on the latency calculation. Okay. So, questions or not? Yep. Just to be clear, so that the end on the right there, the four, we were just speaking earlier about when you break up a multi wired end. You mean this one? Yeah, and the one above it. The yep. Four to third. Yep. So, um, those are broken up the same way that we did earlier here. Right. And so, even though in our chip, Well, the question is basically saying that we cannot use um, three or four or five input AND gates. We can only use two input AND gates. Oh, that's in the question? In the question. Okay, sorry. So the question is adding an extra constraint to things that we have done in the past. Got it, got it. Yep. So now you have to look at this three, which is the longer one, but these two fours are also the longer ones. So you can pick one or the other because they are the same. So four and four are the longer ones. And then they both have to go to the uh, OR gate. So there's no way to avoid this you know, six nanosecond delay because you know, all, the in, all the outputs of the AND gates have to go to the input of the OR gate. The output of this OR gate is K3, <coughs> which is what we want, right? So now we just have to add up the numbers. So we have the three coming here. And then we have the four coming here. And then we have the six coming here. So the overall proper propagational delay for the K3 term, which is our carry out, is going to be 13 nanoseconds. The question is, what is the question asking? Because I cannot remember. So better read the question again. What is the total latency to compute K3? So that is the correct answer. Yep. How do I get a four? You mean this one? Yeah, how do we get the four? Because it has three inputs. Sorry. When it has three inputs, we have to use a staggered um, end gate like this. So this guy has two nanoseconds. This guy doesn't have two nanoseconds. Oh, so it's two nanoseconds per end gate. Yep. And how do you get the six? Huh? How did you get the six? The six is for the OR gate. So this is the OR gate. But this OR gate has four inputs, oh, which I didn't draw here. So this OR gate has four inputs, which means you need, a, you need to break it up kind of like this, except you substitute all the AND gates with OR gates. So the first level of OR gates will give you a three nanosecond propagation delay, and then the second will also give you a three, sec three, millisecond, a three nanosecond. So that's why total you have a six nanosecond delay. Yep. Um, so in the question it asks, what's the total latency to compute in an optimal feedback carry from the magnetic? Yep. Is the word optimal describing breaking up the gate state? In which question? In this one? Question, question number three? three.
Mm -hmm. So given the constraint of two input gates, because you can always make it less efficient. <laughs> Isn't that what breaking up the gates is? And pre-choosing their advantages? Correct. But somebody can you know, break up the gates in a way that is even less efficient than what we have here. OK, I'll, I'll show you exactly what I mean by that. OK, so let's think about the four input gates. OK, so let's switch back to this slide here. So this one, there's a less <coughs> efficient way to do this. Can you guys think? Exactly, we, we stagger even more. Do, do, you, do you see why I mean, what I, why I need to specify the most optimal way to do it? Because there are always kind of, I wouldn't say more stupid ways to do it, but it's definitely not as efficient. Yep? Well, like, couldn't you always just scrap a hand wire to itself from any wire? Yes, both, you know, same wire going to all inputs and then, you know, output doing nothing. Yep, so you can always lengthen the time, but that doesn't mean it is the correct answer. Okay, okay, let me, let me take that argument to the extreme here. That's one thing that I'm really good at. So, for someone who decides, you know what, I really hate to deal with all of these parallel things and whatnot. Actually, you know what, there's no way to avoid this one. Because if, if the question is asking about the latency to the sum bit, you can actually use that trick. You basically just add a whole bunch of useless gates in here, okay? And then because it's all sequential now, right? So it's easy to figure out you know, what the latency is going to be. Then the rest of the latency becomes useless. You don't have to analyze you know, what things are in parallel, how do I break up a multiple input to, to two input you know, gates and stuff like that. Yep? Do you uh, overplay out the first? Yes, that is correct. Because you know, the P and the G terms are both needed for the secondary hand gates, but because the P terms are computed slower, that limits, that becomes your threshold. So that becomes your, your bottom your uh, bottleneck of the entire operation. Yep. So are there any yep, back there. So the showing your reasoning part, you have to draw the whole thing or is it just show the um, if you show the graph, it shows a lot. Okay, you know, if you show the graph, it shows a lot. But then you also have to identify at each level why did you pick this number instead of the other numbers. Like in this case, <coughs> out of the G and the P terms, why did you use the two to add to the latency to give you total latency? So you kind of have to explain, have to explain why you choose one or the other. So why can you get full credit? Um, that's not much. <coughs> you have to draw the whole picture. I mean, I, I cannot see any way to avoid drawing the whole picture. Yep. It's not what? It's last two, but it's, you have to explain that. This one? Yeah. You, it, be, it's because the G and the P terms are both needed for these gates in order to compute. Um, these, the, the output of the AND gates. So if they're both needed, wh whichever one is going to come slower is limiting the overall calculation. Is that okay or not? Yep. So the K3 is the, the fastest output? No, K3 is, I'm just interested in how long it takes for K3 to become valid. That's, that's just what the question is asking. So you basically just asking me what's the slowest path to, path to K3, right? Yes, okay. but based on the, the two things, right? You know, based on the optimal design and also based on the fact that you can only use two input gates. Now the whole thing about using two input gates can be a limitation because of what type of component you're using on the circuitry. Okay, um, if you're using jelly bean parts, okay, does anyone know what is a jelly bean part in terms of uh, logic parts? No, okay. The 74 you know, series of chips, okay, they implement all kinds of gates. So in the case of AND gates, you can buy a single chip that has four two input AND gates on the circuit. 
So if you're trying to build you know, circuitry like this on a breadboard, but using those particular chips, then you have that limitation. They do not offer you a four input AND gate that you need in order to do this. So your only way to implement a four input AND gate from the schematic perspective is to use three actual AND gates on the circuit. So if you need to compute the propagation of delay, you have to take that into consideration. Or if you're dealing with FPGAs or EPLDs, you know, actual devices that are programmable with logic and stuff like that, from the perspective of the specification, you may be able to specify like a 20 input OR gate. Okay, so VHDL will let you do it. The, the language will let you do it. But when you're actually specifying the internal wiring of the uh, circuitry, it may not let you do something like that. So when you're calculating the latency, you have to take that into consideration as well. So there are practical reasons why the you know, propagational delay is important. Okay, question number four. Well, I think you guys would like this one. This is about floating point numbers. Well, I have one more question. Yeah. Uh -huh. I'm not seeing the six seconds decay for me, actually. So it's two seconds per hand gate. Okay, which six are we talking about? This six here? Yeah, the six over here that I have. This uh, is an OR gate? Yes, that's an OR gate. It's three per. Yeah. And then there's, oh, and there's only two. Okay. okay. Yep. So what if you come with the uh, three by three adder to print it out? Like if you print a bunch of them and then if you ask something about the three by three adder, can we just use that and then like draw on paper or whatever you have to do? Yes. Awesome. <laughs> Would you recommend that and ask us that we come with it printed out? Um, I do not know what I will be asking yet, so I cannot make any recommendations. <laughs> <laughs> You cannot possibly look up every single circuit that is, that is within the scope of this, you know, uh, I suppose you can, but that's <laughs> going to be a big pile of paper. Okay, so question number four is asking, assume x is the value represented by a double that has a big pattern of blah, 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 okay, in hexadecimal digits. Um, there's no need to figure out the value of x. Assume y is the value represented by a double that has a big pattern of something else. Explain and compute the ratio of y divided by x. So if you want to figure out the actual value of x and y and then do the division, that works too. Okay? So there's no need to figure out the values themselves. We just I just need the final answer is about the ratio of the values. Okay? So how would you do it? Would you actually figure out the values because that's the safest way? Well, easiest is subjective, right? I mean, some people think one way is easier than the other. Okay, so let's, let's play it safe and actually calculate the values of y and x, and then we actually do the division. Yep, go ahead. That will only give you some, a part of the ratio, but not the entire ratio, okay? All right, so let's go ahead and work on this one. <clears throat> And I'm just going to write down the bit patterns. So x is 0x4028, and then a bunch of zeros. y is 0x403c, and a bunch of zeros. OK, there we go. So now we switch back to the tablet. Um, OK, first of all, do you think it is difficult to convert this into the actual value represented by the double without the help of GDB? Okay. Now, even though the numbers are really long, you know, they have each one has 16 hexadecimal digits, only the first four really matter because the rest are all zeros. And we know that all of those that are zeros are a part of the mantissa. So that means that you know, we have a whole bunch of trailing zeros which doesn't really affect the value that we are dealing with. So that's actually, it helps to simplify things a lot. So in this case, you know, we have 4028. 4 is 0, 1, 0, 0, 0 is 0, 0, 0, 0, 2 is 0, 0, 1, 0, and 8 is 1, 0, 0, 0. <coughs> if you think it might be helpful, you can also you know, make your own um, hexadecimal to binary conversion table, okay? 
Um, I just so happen to supply that you know, with this particular exam, but don't count on it, okay? <laughs> Anything that you, you think might be helpful, bring it yourself, <laughs> okay? Self-sufficient is a good thing. This is the sign bit, okay? And both numbers have the sign, same sign bit, not an issue. The next 11 bits is the exponent, okay? Or it's E, okay? So when you look at this particular value, can someone quickly tell me what it is? What value is this thing? I'm not looking at the actual exponent, I just want to know the unsigned value represented by these bits. It's 1024 plus 2 because you know, bit 10 is a 1 and then bit 1 is, excuse me, bit 10 is a 1 and then bit 1 is also a 1. And that's why we add 2 to the power of 10 and 2 to the power of 1. So that turns out to be 1026. And then this is the fractional part of the mantissa, which also tell, it, it's telling me that the mantissa is just 1.1 in base 2. So the only thing left to do is to subtract 1023 from 1026 because that's the bias. So that will give me 3. So that means my actual exponent of 2 is 3. Is that okay? So then I can do the same trick with the other number. <clears throat> 4 is 0, 1, 0, 0. 0 is 0, 0, 0, 0. 3 is 0, 0, 1, 1. C is 1, 1, 0, 0. Do the same thing. This is our sign bit, totally useless. Um, and then we look at these bits here. And you can see that they're only off by 1. Right? There's a 0 here, and now there's a 1 here. So they're only off by 1 which also is telling me right away that we are dealing with 2 to the power of 4. So now the only other question is, what is the mantissa? The mantissa is off by just a little bit too. The old mantissa is 1.1, so this mantissa is 1.11. But that's in base 2. So you have to remember, it is important to not understand that this is all in base 2. So we have 1.1 in base 2, and then we have 1.11 in base 2. Which one? Where? The second number for the y that you wrote it down in binary. What's the last four digits? Of the these four last these yeah. four digits. They are the fractional portion of the mantissa. So that's why you know I'm appending the one one zero zero to the implied one point. The one point is always implied. It's never represented in the in the, in the big pattern. So the 110 is appended here, but I, I don't even bother to write the 00, zero because those are all trailing zeros in to the right-hand side of the binary point, so they're not going to be useful at all. Okay, so now you can do the, uh, carry out the subtraction, but before you carry out the subtraction, you can also convert this to 1.5 in base 10 times 8, and then this one over here, the other number, is 1.75 times... Uh, 16. So now we can do the actual division and get a result. If you run out of time, okay, if you run out of time, if you just give me this answer, 1.75 times 16 divided by 1.5 times 8, I will consider that 100% correct. How do I know what? How do you know it starts with 1.1? Like, not 0.1. The 1 point? Yeah, not the 1 point. That's how uh, double precision floating point numbers are formatted. Okay. Yep. For getting the exponent part, are you accounting for the like, little offset of like 1023 with that, with like 1026 there? Uh, you mean with this one? Uh, up into the right side. The one here? Oh, I see. I, I didn't even notice that that was minus 1023. Yeah, minus 1023 is 3, so this one is just one more of that. That makes sense. <coughs>
But once again, you know, if you go through this calculation, it shows me that you know how to break apart a double and then figure out which one is the exponent, which part is the matisse, and then you can you can get to this point. That is okay. You don't have to simplify this. This can be done with a calculator. So anything that can easily be done with a calculator, you know, is not important to me. Yep. Say that one more time. Um, I cannot see which part you're referring to. Are you referring to these bits here? Yeah. Which no. becomes this bit here? No. I subtract 1023 from 1026 because that's the bias. The bias, the bias of E. Okay, so maybe it's time to start some studying. <laughs> yes. So there are a few things that you have to kind of get through with this one. You know, phase conversion is one because you know you have to remember how to interpret uh, numbers with a decimal point, but in binary. And I'm thinking most calculators cannot deal with binary numbers with a point. I can be wrong. <laughs> If you have a programmable calculator, you're more than welcome to program in your own stuff you know, to prepare for the test. Okay, so we have one more question and we are almost running out of time. And this is the other way around. How do we represent negative 5.625 as a double? Double precision floating point number. Specify the bit pattern in hexadecimal and show your steps including figuring out the various parts of a base two scientific notation and how the parts fit together as, as, a, as a double. Okay, so let's, let me copy the question on my tablet first and then we'll start to work on it. Okay, negative 5.625, okay. All right, so what, what do we do with this? Okay, sine is one, would that be okay? because the number is negative, so I know immediately that the sign is a one. Yes. Okay. So if I'm doing this, you know, I would, do I would do something like this. I would look at this number here, and I say, oh, this is the same thing as 101.101, 101 point, um, 101 in base two. So I can make that conclusion right away, but if you cannot, it's okay. You can take a few more steps. So you can basically say, okay, let's not do this part here. So let's say this cannot be done in one step. So what you do is you try to express 5.625 as a sum of powers of two, okay? So you say, oh, this is the same thing as four plus one plus a half and then plus an eighth, okay? I'm pretty sure you guys can do this, okay? So then you can say this is 2 to the power of 2 plus 2 to the power of 0 plus 2 to the power of negative 1 plus 2 to the power of negative 3. Okay? Which then becomes 1, 0, 0 in base 2 plus 1 in base 2 plus 0 0.1 in base 2 plus 0 0, 0.001 1 in base 2. And this is a, a negative 3. There we go. Is that okay? Because you know, the only thing you have to remember is everything to the right-hand side of the point 
would be halves, quarters, eighths, and so on. So you're just counting places, okay? So when you add up these numbers, it's 101.101 .101 in base two. So that's kind of like the longer way to do it. I can just kind of visualize because I can recognize most of the multiples of powers of two now. But if you cannot, just go through this process. It's not that lengthy. Okay, so now that you know this, then you say 101.101 .101 in base two is the same thing as 10. Zero, whoops, one zero, one one zero one, sorry, okay, one zero point one one zero one in base two times two to the power of what? I'm making the mantissa smaller, so I have to increase the exponent to adjust for that. So, whoops, one here, and then we take it one more step. One zero one one zero one in base two times two to the power of two now, right? It, it, you can also do a sandwich check at, along every single step. So the question is, does that number, you know, eighty five point you know, uh, six two five, is it kind of like you know four plus something? Because this one is multiplied to four, so you basically say, okay, is it like a little, little bit more than four? Well, you know, five point something is kind of a little more than four. So it passes the, the sanity check. So you can basically do all this little check as long, you know, when, you, when you do the calculation. Okay, so at this point, you can now say, ah, I have identified all the crucial parts, right? Because now you can say, this is the fractional mantissa. So this is the fractional mantissa. This here is our E2, okay? So now you can put the whole thing together. Now, not quite, because now that we know what E2 is, we have to say E is E2 plus the bias, which is 1023. So in this case, it's two plus 1023, which is 1025, okay? Because you know, when you represent it in a double, you have to use the biased version of that number, okay? And that turns out to be uh, one, followed by nine zeros, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and a one after that, because it's 1024 plus one. Okay, so now we got all the major parts, and now we it's time to put everything together. And so you basically say the sign is a one, and then your E is one, zero, 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 one, two, three, four, five, and a one, and then your, the fractional mantissa is what we said a little bit earlier. It is zero, one, one, zero, one. And then you just have a whole bunch of zeros after that. The question, if you give me this as an answer, you get partial credit, most of the credit, but not the entire thing because the question asks for a hexadecimal representation. So then you group these things by four. Okay. So now you have C, 0, 1, 6, 8, and then a whole bunch of zeros. And yes, you can use a whole bunch of zeros like I do. That's good, yep. So that should be the answer. Is that okay? So I think that is all the questions in this one. Yep, five questions, five out of five now. Huh? Are there solutions for the other exams or just the questions? Um, I think one of them actually has solution you know, because uh, there's a file called dash answered. Oh, okay. So that one does have the solution. And then the one before that may not have the answer inside the test itself. All right. So we're going to go to the late lab. So once again, the lab is not doing activity. You're not going to do anything, but I am going to do something. I will explain the answers to um, the earlier labs. So this way, you know, I'm hoping that it will make connections to the understanding of floating point numbers. And then we can also do some other explanations during the lab time.